Welcome to Bible study. We are studying the book of Revelation. We are now up to chapter 12, and today we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. I call this the woman clothed with the sun. Uh, you, we are taking the book of Revelation bite-sized chunks. There's a lot to digest, so don't really want to you know, try to preach a whole chapter. Uh, that might take, you know, five, six hours to get through. So I think the uh, smaller uh, segments are much uh, easier to digest. Uh, verse 1 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. I have titled our study of chapters 12 through 14 as Systems of Religion. The preview we did in our previous lecture suggested that the systems of religion seen in these chapters correspond with the seven parts of the visions of the seals and the trumpets which we have previously studied. In these chapters, we find, first of all, the woman, and we find her in two conditions. Then we find the red dragon. We find the beast rising up out of the sea. Then we see a lamb-like beast. And then finally, we see the lamb on Mount Zion with, first of all, a reaping of a harvest and then a gathering of clusters of grapes. So we find within these chapters seven religious situations we can loosely call religious systems. Matthew Henry, a Bible commentator, begins his comments on these chapters with these words. Now this is, sounds a little like old English to us, so put it in low gear and follow through as best you can. He wrote, it is generally agreed by the most learned expositors that the narrative we have in this and the two following chapters, from the sounding of the seventh trumpet to the opening of the vials, is not a prediction of things to come, but rather a recapitulation and a representation of things past, which, as God would have the apostle to foresee while future, he would have him to review now that they were past, that he might have a more perfect idea of them in his mind, and might observe the agreement between the prophecy and that providence that is always fulfilling the scriptures. Did anybody get what Dr. Henry had to say? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, his English may be somewhat uh, incomprehensible to us in the 21st century America, so let's restate what he wrote in words that might be a little bit more understandable and fewer. He says, the chapters we are about to study do not predict future events at this point in the Revelation. Rather, they look back on what has been revealed to give us a better understanding of what we have studied. Did you understand that? I can understand that a little bit better. So thank you, Dr. Henry. I, I love his commentary, but sometimes uh, the English of his time is just, just a little bit too deep for us. So chapters 12 through 14 cover the same church history as the series on the seals and the trumpets. Now, the first thing that we encounter in this part of the vision is a woman clothed with the sun. Verse 2 informs us that this woman is with child. So this is a clear cheer, a picture of the nature of the early church. This is the first system of religion we're going to talk about, the early church. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, but the Jerusalem that is above is free, which is the mother of us all. In this text, Paul is comparing the two covenants. On one hand, the law of the Old Testament, and on the other, the gospel of the New Testament. He likens the gospel to Jerusalem, using it for a metaphor for the church. Adam Clark, one of my favorite commentators, expands on the meaning of this Jerusalem. He wrote, 
there is a spiritual Jerusalem of which this is the type. And this Jerusalem in which the souls of all the righteous are is free from all bondage and sin. Or by this probably the kingdom of the Messiah was intended. And this certainly answers best to the apostle's meaning as the subsequent verse shows. There is an earthly Jerusalem, but this earthly Jerusalem typifies a heavenly Jerusalem. The former, with all her children, is in bondage. The latter is a free city, and all her inhabitants are free also. And this Jerusalem is our mother. It signifies the Church of Christ, the metropolis of Christianity, or rather, the state of liberty into which all true believers are bought. So, uh, the Jerusalem that is from above, that is the mother of us all, Clark is explaining, is the church as built by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Uriah Smith, the Adventist uh, writer, in his book, Thoughts Critical and Practical on the Book of Revelation, that he wrote back in 1875, briefly outlines the symbolism of these first two verses. He writes, a woman, the true church, the sun, the light and glory of the gospel dispensation, the moon, the mosaic dispensation. As the moon shines with the borrowed light derived from the sun, so the former dispensation shone with a light borrowed from the present. There we had the type and the shadow. Here we have the antitype and substance. Then he says, a crown of 12 stars, the 12 apostles. Uh, Uriah Smith was the first author to really delve into the book of Revelation uh, from the, what's called the church historic perspective. There were other people that also picked up on that. One was a man familiar to us in the Church of God movement, uh, F.G. Smith, in his book, The Revelation Explained, says essentially the same thing as Uriah Smith said, but in more words. He wrote, this first symbol in the scene, the woman, directs us most definitely into the department of the church for its fulfillment. We have, therefore, the original church of God in the morning time of the Christian era. The Bible recognizes two kinds of light, natural and spiritual. Therefore, the one may very appropriately be based, excuse me, be used to symbolize the other. Christ is the Son of Righteousness. The light of the glorious gospel of Christ now shines in and through his church. And so we may infer that the brightest luminaries of heaven gathered around the woman in this vision may be des designed to express her heavenly character, her spiritual equipment, power, and glory. This view is strengthened by the suggestiveness of the royal insignia, a crown of 12 stars. The 12 stars in the diadem of the church allude to the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Later, uh, in a later edition of this work, uh, F.G. Smith expands on the meaning of the light, giving an explanation for the moon. In that edition, he writes, the moon is a fit symbol of the Old Covenant, above which the church had just risen. Remember, she was standing on the moon, only to be clothed in the superior brightness and glory of the New Covenant, which he says is the sun. And as the moon shines only with borrowed light, obtaining its illumination from the sun, so also the Old Covenant was only a shadow of the good things to come and now stands eclipsed in the brightness and transcendent glory of that new and better dispensation. A movement that later separated from what was called the Church of God Reformation movement, calling its own self the Seventh Trumpet Message or the Seventh Seal Church, still followed the same interpretation 
as both of these Smiths. In a book titled The Revelation with Gospel and Prophecy, the writers explain on these verses. Here the revelation follows Isaiah the prophet and uses a pure woman to symbolize the true church, which is Mount Zion. This woman standing on the moon, clothed with the sun, with a crown of 12 stars upon her head, is surely a symbol of the New Testament church built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Standing on the moon would symbolize the old covenant under her feet. The light of the moon is in reality a reflection or shadow of the sun, the real light. The crown of 12 stars on her head would symbolize the 12 apostles, which were lively headstones of the church. The woman herself is a symbol of the church, the true tabernacle the Lord pitched and not man. So three different sets of author, authors over a period of approximately 70 years uh, find a consistency in the uh, interpretations of these symbols that open the book of Revelation. This helps us to understand then the first system of religion illustrated by this woman is the church Jesus built and inaugurated on the day of Pentecost. So, as we open chapter 12, look at verses 1-2. We're looking back in history to the day of Pentecost. We saw that in the, uh, the, the seals, the first seal, the church on the white horse with a rider going forth to uh, conquering and to conquer. And then we saw that in the uh, first trumpet uh, showing us the, the glory of that early church that Jesus built. First, we must understand that Jesus did in fact build his particular church. Matthew verse 16, verse 18, on this rock I will build my church. That's what Jesus said. Okay, was the church actually built? Did Jesus really build a church? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The Apostle Paul had uh, called the elders from the church at Ephesus to meet him, and he says to them, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. There certainly was a church at the time of the Apostle Paul. Jesus built his church on the rock, which is to say that he built his church upon himself. And Paul here says that he purchased the church with his own blood. The atonement he made through his blood on the cross is that very blood. And that is the revelation that he is in fact the Son of God and Redeemer of mankind. The church exists because Jesus gave himself a sacrifice for us. He shed his blood that we could be saved from sin. We could add, be added to the kingdom of God and the body of Christ, which the Bible says is his church. Jesus identifies himself with his church because it is his body. Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. Paul again writing, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Did Jesus build his church? Certainly did. And that church is identified as his body, the church. The church came into being on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 record that auspicious event. If you remember, the disciples, the 120, were in one place on this day of Pentecost. 
and in all probability that place was the, the open temple grounds there in Jerusalem. And on that day the Holy Spirit came on them and filled them. This was the time when the disciples who were at first devout Jews, you remember, were actually born of the Spirit and this was the opening of the Gospel dispensation. The church is pictured as a woman in Revelation chapter 12 verse 1. And I'll say this, that she is pictured as a married woman that is expecting a child. In Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 to 27, the Apostle Paul places the church in the same relationship to Christ as the wife to the husband. Okay? He says in verses 22 to 24, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So this beautiful woman clothed in the sun, standing on the moon with this diadem of 12 stars, is the church which is married to Christ. She's obviously married because she's about to have a baby. And we see that the Bible teaches us that the relationship between Jesus and his church is pictured as a relationship between the husband and wife. John sees the church clothed with the sun. The prophet Malachi foresaw this in Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. He wrote, For behold the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. This is, in fact, a messianic prophecy, but it also appears to suggest the day of Pentecost. Jesus had come and made atonement for sins. This is pictured as a burning oven that burns up sin like stubble. For those that accept the gospel and experience the atonement, Christ, Malachi says, is the Son of Righteousness. If you look at your Bibles, you'll notice there that the word Son is capitalized indicating divinity. But it's not the word son, S-O-N, as a boy, boy child. It is son, S-U-N, as the sun that shines light on the earth. So it's interesting that uh, some 400 years before the gospel, God impresses upon Malachi to call Jesus the son, S-U-N, of righteousness. And then almost a hundred years after Jesus comes, that word son is used to describe him as the clothing of this woman, the church. The light of this son sheds his light on the souls of mankind and heals the wounds of sin. But see that his light also produces growth like stall-fed calves. Sp personal spiritual growth and growth of the church is pictured in this prophecy. Now Paul speaks of this light in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 where he calls the gospel the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Uh, Albert Barnes, another commentator, commentates on this light. He writes, The light is the emblem of knowledge, purity, or innocence. 
and is here and elsewhere applied to the gospel because it removes the errors and sins and wretchedness of men as the light of the sun scatters the shades of night. That's just a beautiful way of expressing it. The sun of righteousness, when Christ shines his light into our souls, it uh, uh, scatters all the shades of the darkness of the night of sin. Now the woman stands on the moon, and this indicates the change in dispensations where the gospel has risen above the Old Testament, but yet is still supported by it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Paul teaches about the importance of the Old Testament. Of events recorded in the Old Testament, he writes this, Now all these things happen to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Certainly we are living in New Testament times. Certainly we are in the gospel dispensation. But we don't tear the Old Testament out of our Bibles and throw it away. It has very much value to us. Matthew Henry again writes, Their history was written to be a standing monitor to the church, even under the last and most perfect dispensation. To us, on whom the end of the world has come, the concluding period of God's gracious government over man. Note, nothing in Scripture is written in vain. God had wise and gracious purposes towards us in leaving the Jewish history upon record. And it is our wisdom and duty to receive instruction from it. Upon this hint, the apostle grounds a caution. So these things happen as an example to us for our admonition. So we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, the gospel of Christ, the son of righteousness. We have risen above the moon, the Old Testament, but we're still standing on it because it has value to us even in the New Testament dispensation. We also saw that this woman wore a garland or a crown of 12 stars on her head. When the woman is understood to be the church built by Jesus, it is quite obvious that this garland represents the 12 apostles of Christ. Jesus had many disciples, but he particularly called 12. In Luke chapter 6, verse 13, and when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. So, Jesus himself called and ordained 12 among his disciples to be the apostles. The apostles, 12 apostles, were the original cadre of the church Jesus sent out as he began to expand the influence of the church on the world. Now the original apostles, except for Judas, remained in Jerusalem until after the conversion of Paul. From that time on, the church expanded. Each of the original apostles met a martyr's death, except for the apostle John. James was the first apostle to die. He was killed by Herod in Jerusalem. That's recorded in the book of Acts for us. Philip died in Hierapolis in Asia Minor in 52 AD. Matthew died in Parthia in AD 60. Matthias, who replaced Judas, died in Jerusalem. Andrew, remember Andrew? He went to get his brother bring him to Jesus. Andrew was crucified at Petre in Greece. Peter was said to have died in AD 64 in Rome during the persecution under Nero. Paul, the apostle Jesus, later added to the church, also died in Rome under that same persecution of Nero. Bartholomew, 
translated Matthew's gospel into the language of the heathen nations. He later was killed either by the sword or he was beaten to death. Thomas, remember doubting Thomas, took the gospel to India where he was killed by a spear. And then John died a natural death in Ephesus at the age of about 100. These men were the original cadre that Jesus chose to spread the message of the gospel away from Jerusalem, away from Israel, into Asia Minor and southeastern Europe, all the way out to India, and then down into North Africa. Now, the last, wing, last thing we see about the church is in verse 12, and that is she is in labor about to give birth. The actual birth is recorded in verse 5 as the birth of a man-child. Now, it's interesting that of the eight Bible versions I use in my study, the New King James Version is the only version that capitalizes the word child in that verse. And that capitalization suggests that the child is Jesus. That just can't possibly be. The footnote in my study Bible says the woman represents the true people of God, which is true, the faithful Israel before Christ came, and his church today. The child is Jesus. And the footnote gives no support for the statement. I say it cannot be Jesus because Jesus was not born from either the church or the nation of Israel. Jesus is God incarnate who was born of the Virgin Mary. And the woman is not the Virgin Mary. She's clearly the church that Jesus built. So, this birth that we see, the woman bringing forth the man-child, began on the day of Pentecost, where it is said in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, that about 3,000 souls were added to them. Boy, what a birthday that was. The Spirit of God had come upon the disciples, and uh, they crossed over into the gospel dispensation. And then Peter got up and preached a message. And at the end of that message, about 3,000 were added to the church. That's the man-child, the beginning of the man-child that was born. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the Bible says that the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. This man-child is getting larger all the time. In Acts chapter 4, verse 4, after the first scuffle of persecution from the Jews, the Bible says many of those that heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Man-child getting larger and larger. And finally, the growth of the church was so strong that the Bible simply says in Acts chapter 5, verse 14, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. That was some baby. That man-child was the host of converts experienced by the church beginning on the day of Pentecost and carrying on through that first era of church history. So, the first two verses of chapter 12 introduce us to the first system of religion in this series. This system was new in the world. While God had a people under the Old Testament, the provisions of that system never really dealt with the human condition. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 says that it was only a shadow of the heavenly things because in Hebrews 10, 11, we are told that the sacrifices of that system could never take away sin. What takes away sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. The great sign that appeared in the heaven of Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, ushered in a new and perfect system of 
that actually corrects the human condition. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Wow. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ did. That's what the New Testament gospel is all about. Perfecting, completing those who are made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. With the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the disciples of Jesus, the church was born, and Jesus began the process of building that church. That building is pictured by the birth of the child as believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women. In our next lecture, we will learn that simultaneously with the appearance of the church and its phenomenal growth, it was vehemently opposed by another system of religion pictured as a great fiery red dragon. So study the next several verses for next week. Amen.